Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome, welcome to this episode of the She's Got Gall podcast brought to you by the Georgia Association for Women Lawyers. I am Ebony Phillips, your host, and we have a dynamic episode for you all tonight. We are still in our series, She Was the First, Conversations with Women Trailblazers, and boy, do we have a trailblazer to talk to tonight. None other than Georgia's first woman secretary of state, Kathy Cox is here, and I'm so excited. I'm talking fast. I'm a little bit winded because I don't want to eat up too much of the preliminary perfunctory kind of time that we have to take up to do intros and stuff. But I do want to give her a proper introduction, and then we're going to dive right into our conversation. So if you've ever um, thought about being a trailblazer, wanted to be a trailblazer, this is the interview and the episode you need to listen to because she knows all about it. Kathy Cox became Georgia's Georgia College's 12th president on October 1st, 2021. Prior to joining Georgia College, she served as Dean for Mercer University School of Law, and that was from 2017 to 2021, and served as president of Young Harris College for a decade prior to that. A native of Bainbridge, Georgia, her distinguished career in law, education, politics, and journalism embodies what it means to have a quote unquote liberal arts background. Having first pursued an interest in cultivating plants, she earned her associate's degree at Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College in Tifton, Georgia, before turning her attention to journalism at the University of Georgia, where she graduated summa cum laude. Writing for the Times of Gainesville and the Post Searchlight of Bainbridge, she would cover local crime and the courts, inspiring her to pursue a degree in law. She served as editor-in-chief for the Mercer Law Review before graduating magna cum laude from Mercer Law School. She practiced law in her hometown of Bainbridge and in Atlanta for 10 years, during which time she was elected to the Georgia House of Representatives. She subsequently broke new ground, becoming a trailblazer as it were, in her election as Georgia's Secretary of State, becoming the first woman in Georgia's history to serve in this constitutional office. She was the first. During her term as president of Young Harris, the small private liberal arts college garnered a reputation for excellence, growing from a two-year to a four-year institution. She was recognized for her work in 2017 with the Young Harris College Medallion and was named an honorary alumna. In 2020, she was named Georgia's Woman Lawyer of the Year by the Middle Georgia Chapter of the Georgia Association for Women Lawyers. She is a graduate of Leadership Georgia and the recipient of Leadership Georgia's prestigious J.W. Fanning Award for progressive leadership and service. She has served on a number of civic, philanthropic, and business organizations and boards and is a prolific thought leader, delivering scores of keynote speeches and presentations and conducting media interviews on a wide range of topics spanning her expertise in higher education, law, politics, and election law and integrity. She is married to attorney Mark Daler. Please help me welcome President Kathy Cox. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Ebony. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a very, very tight schedule. And so we're so grateful that you have fit us in. I wanted to just give a little bit of context to our conversation here tonight, because one of the things that we are striving to do is to create a uh, value and valuable content for our membership. And one of the things that we heard quite a bit was we have people who are aspiring to ascend to different roles and to assume, you know, greater responsibility as it were. And they want to hear from people who've been where they're trying to go. They want to hear from people who have sort of trailblazed such as yourself. And so that's how the Trailblazer series was was actually conceived. And I thought, you know what? Normally, I would ask people like, okay, so when did you know you wanted to become a lawyer or the president of Georgia College or any of those things? But it's sort of self-explanatory in your bio. But what kind of stuck out to me, and then we'll get to the business at hand, is that you first pursued an interest in cultivating plants. I would love to know how that came about. Well, that's probably uh, sort of genetic. You know, I, I attribute that as much as anything to having two great gardener grandmothers. Okay. Uh, as a child, I grew up with grandmothers who had big gardens, uh, everything from vegetable gardens and strawberry gardens to flower, camellia, 
uh, plant gardens, but I loved mm -hmm. working in the garden with my grandparents. Um, as a high school student, my, one of my first summer jobs was working at a plant nursery down in yeah. my hometown of Bainbridge. Um, so that was my first if you look at my social security statement, you know, that you get, start getting in the mail. It, right. I, I earned this pittance of about $250 that summer working oh at goodness. the nursery in Bainbridge, Georgia. But I really did um, love working with plants and I still have a green thumb. Uh, after I interned, I started majoring in plant science agriculture at Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College in okay. Tifton, Georgia. I interned as a horticultural intern at Callaway Gardens one summer. And um, oh, that Callaway. summer was a real awakening. It was beautiful. If you've ever been to Callaway Gardens, oh, yes. you learned to do everything yes. to perfection. They yes. rotated students around the garden. But after pulling weeds in 100 degree <laughs> weather next to PhDs in botany, I said, you know, <laughs> maybe I should have a job in the air conditioning somewhere. <laughs> um, and I really did change my major after that. But I, so I now say plants are my avocation, uh, but I found another uh, pursuit for my actual major and changed to journalism when I got to the University of Georgia. Oh, I love that. I absolutely love that. Go dogs. Um, so I was looking at um, sort of just some facts and figures and we know that you are the first woman secretary of state um, in, for our state in Georgia. Um, what people may not know is that I believe you were the 25th secretary of state, if I'm not mistaken about that. But what kind of struck me even more than that is that you were elected or served in like around 1999 to 2007. So not only were there 24 other secretaries of state who had every single one of them been a man, but we made it almost to the year 2000 before we elected a woman to that office. I just want the, the audience to let that sink in for a minute. Like we're not talking about, you know, the early 1800s. We're talking about almost the year 2000. What, um, what was that well, journey like? Well, before I answer the question to your point, run down the list of all of the constitutional offices in Georgia. Mm -hmm. There are still only two that women have served in, the Secretary of State's office and the school superintendent. Wow. We have not had a woman insurance commissioner. We have not had a woman agriculture commissioner. Wow. We have not had a lieutenant governor or governor as a female. So wow. we've still got a long way to go, and it's 2022. So. Wow. And so you know, that kind of puts the whole conversation in the series in, in perspective in a way, because although we have a lot to celebrate and women such as yourself have made great strides, there's no doubt about that. But there's so much more that we we have to do to keep moving the needle forward. Um, and so, wow, I'm sorry, that just... And, and maybe for our audience in particular, we've never had a woman as the Attorney General of mm. Georgia. So you can go down the list. Yeah. Women still yeah. have strides to make and it and it's time. It's beyond time. Yeah. So Gall members, y'all hear that? The, there are positions available for trailblazing. That's um, right. We've and, got and, trailblazers on the ballot this year. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, but what was that journey like? I know that um, you know, sometimes you have to make a lot of sacrifices to succeed and so when we see you getting sworn in and there's maybe a, a big parade or however they do it, nobody except maybe your inner circle kind of knows what that journey was to get there. Um, and I'm just curious because reading your your bio, it seems like, wow, this thing just went from one to two to three to four to five and just almost flawless execution as it reads on paper, right? But we know that it it, it never goes like that. Um, what part of the, the journey do you think was the most challenging, um, but also the most rewarding? That, that's an excellent question. Um, and it does often look pretty easy on paper. Uh, to, to my family uh, and friends who were there with me along the journey, they know it, it was not necessarily right. an easy path. Um, 
it was um, both when I first ran for the legislature in 1992 in okay. Southwest Georgia, where they had never elected a woman to the House of Representatives. Um, and when I first ran for Secretary of State, every week, some at least if not daily, I had to answer the question Seriously, people would ask me, they were not ashamed to ask me, do you really think a woman can do this job? Uh, oh, wow. Because people had not seen it. And, wow. and it is so, that's why it is so important to have mm -hmm. diverse faces in our political offices, in all right. offices of leadership, uh, right. business or elected office, because seeing a different face makes a difference to generations of people that come after us, but people had not seen it. And week after week, when I was running for secretary of state, mm -hmm. people would say, I'm not sure a woman can do this job. And I would say, it does not involve heavy lifting. <laughs> you know? um, but just to sort of put a little humor into it, but to make them think, come on folks, this yeah. is a job that involves uh, intelligence and uh, political skills of getting along with people and getting the sure. job done. Sure. It is not a gender specific job, never has been, but it's time right. to think differently. Right. And the gratifying part was that I won in my first race for the House of Representatives when I took on a 16 year incumbent wow. who completely did not take me seriously because I don't yeah. think he thought people would vote for a woman or a lawyer in mm -hmm. rural Southwest Georgia and yeah. running for the legislature when a lot of people doubted me. The frustrating part was the sexism that yeah. sadly still remained in Georgia. Um, but to know that the majority of Georgia voters said, I think she can do the job and I'll give her my vote was, um, I think, I hope a big step to open doors for a lot of other people who maybe never have to answer that question. Right, right. And so your immediate job before that, did you go straight from the House of Representatives to the Secretary of State's position? Is that how, okay. I, and so I, I, had a, I had a year and a half or so Lewis Massey had been appointed Secretary of State, and he asked me to come and work with him as the Assistant Secretary of State. Okay. So I had the advantage of working in the office for a little while, and then Lewis, everyone assumed, would run for Secretary of State, but he chose to run for governor mm -hmm. in 1998, and that's when everybody sort of looked around and said, well, who's going to run for Secretary of State? And I said, well, I know I can do the job. I don't have any money. I'm not yeah. known statewide, yeah. but I know I can do this job. And that's when I decided to run. Um, I had the advantage of knowing the job. And I do think it was an advantage that I had served in the legislature and made friends on both yeah. sides of the aisle. Yeah. Um, I think I had established myself, particularly for the office of Secretary of State running elections as, as a fair dealer, mm -hmm. um, as a lawyer who understood the law and would treat people fairly. And so I think, knock on wood, I did not have a strong, a really strong Republican opponent. I did not have any Democratic uh, opposition because I think I had made enough friends to get me started in a, mm -hmm. a, a stronger direction than many perhaps have that opportunity. So you kind of hit on this a minute ago, but I just want to go back to it just to make sure that we don't gloss over it too much. Do you think that the road to becoming the first is different for men than it is for women? What's your take on that? Oh, absolutely. Um, number one, there's almost never a chance that a man is the first because men have filled so many leadership positions forever. Right. Um, and so it's, it's rare that a, a man takes on a leadership position as the first. Now, certainly men have moved into female dominated professions like mm -hmm. nursing, for example. And I suspect that uh, that some men moving in that direction have faced criticism and even 
maybe sort of reverse sexism and, and have found a way to prove to the world that nurses are not gender specific, mm -hmm. but women get criticized that they're not smart enough. They're, they're either too pretty or they're not pretty enough. All of these superficial things based on their looks that are right. never in my right. experience, never applied to males moving into other positions. So after you became the first though, so you've you've overcome that milestone and overcome all the sexism and all the doubting and naysayers and people that probably just had never seen it before. Maybe they, you know, meant well, but that was their life experience. Did you find that there was greater scrutiny um, or maybe greater pro professional pressure and, and that came along with that? Oh, all the time. Um, I mean, it just it just came with the territory. Yeah. You, you knew you were being watched. You wanted to to succeed. Obviously, personally, you wanted to succeed, but you wanted to succeed for everybody that you knew could and should come after you. But there were there was always criticism of or, or critiques of how mm -hmm. you look. Uh, mm -hmm. of whether you were shrill, whether you were getting called the B word, which, yeah. you know, just becomes yeah. old yeah. hat. Once you become a lawyer and you become assertive, the B word becomes your middle name. And mm -hmm. so, so what really? You yeah. just get used to that. But uh, it's a different kind of pressure for men who try to take on leadership roles. So you just get accustomed to it. But uh, you're also breaking into what has been an old boys network mm -hmm. uh, in the political system. And I had to, to, to fight through those kind of, of barriers or um, uh, glass ceilings for sure to show mm -hmm. that I was going to do my work in a different way, uh, that I certainly could get along with people, um, that I could be nice or I could be tough. Right. Um, uh, I didn't choose to pick a fight, but I certainly wasn't going to run for it, run from it if that was going to be necessary to get my point across. And right. so eventually people learned that about me. So you have blazed a trail and you're a shero to a lot of us. Um, your name comes up often in those types of conversations. But I was just wondering, um, who is it that you admire? Who is it that you look up to and why? Gosh, there's a long list um, of men and women. You know, there there were certainly uh, men. I mean, number one was my father, who was not a lawyer, but he was in the legislature. He was in politics really all of my childhood. And I, I learned how to be, a, I think, a, a good public servant from his role. Uh, as a legislator, uh, we used to talk about the legislature all the time, and I really learned kind of the the backstory of mm -hmm. the newspaper story said this, but here's what the speaker is really going to do. And so I learned a lot of the give and take about legislative politics before I ever had the chance to run. And I didn't run until after he passed away. But I, I, I certainly looked up to him. But even while he was living and I had the chance to intern in the Georgia legislature, uh, there were a, a small handful of women serving at the time. Um, Kathy Steinberg from Metro Atlanta, Eleanor Richardson from DeKalb County. I just adored those women uh, because they were real trailblazers back in the day when there was not even a women's restroom mm. uh, for women members of the House of Representatives. And they had to go out down the hall, find a public restroom. Uh, they really uh, wow. blazed trails for all of us who followed them. But I just loved those women and had the chance to get to know many of them um, who served for a long time um, before women really gained some traction in the legislature. As a lawyer uh, going to Mercer Law School, um, I, I really admired Ruth West, uh, who was the second woman to serve as the editor-in-chief of Mercer's Law Review. I was the third, but I just, I was really, I had a girl crush on her uh, forever <laughs> and still do. She lives up, she's retired up around uh, Lake Burton in Rabin County now. And mm -hmm. I, I do keep in touch with her, but I thought she was beautiful and smart and brilliant. She had a yes. job at Keenan Spaulding. Uh, she had made it in the big leagues of mm -hmm. big law 
and uh, from Mercer. And I just thought she was everything. And she was always very kind to me uh, over the years as a student, as a young lawyer, and, uh, and even now as a, as a college president, we keep in touch. That's awesome. What is, uh, you mentioned a number of people. And so it sounds to me like you are open to receiving um, people are throwing around the word mentorship advice. I don't know what it's called today. You know, it changes from day to day, but what's the best, and I'm sure you've gotten a lot, but if you had to just pick just for purposes of our conversation, what's the best career advice you've ever received? That, that's a tough question. And, and I, I don't have a complicated answer. Um, it, it's just really to th- of mentors, particularly in in law practice, of just doing the best with whatever is put in front of you and Mm -hmm. always asking for more uh, because especially early early in your career, you you build your reputation uh, from your early partners who give you work. And A, you just want to do good work, but Mm -hmm. you build a reputation of Are you checking out at 530 every day or six o'clock or are you walking the halls to see who's still working and say, uh, hey, can I help you with anything? Even if it means you have to stay till seven or eight, you get a reputation of, hey, she she's dependable. She'll Mm -hmm. take on an extra task. I'm going to I'm going to give her something good when the when something else comes around and you build up these relationships Everything in life, everything in law practice, everything in politics comes down to relationships that you mm. make. And you can't build those relationships if you're flying out the door, even if it's to do something fun and, and it's about personal relationships. There's a time for everything. And I'm not mm-hmm. saying sacrifice all of your personal relationships, but if you're thinking about your career, think about doing the extra, going the extra mile, uh, mm-hmm. and being available to those people who who really will determine how far you're going to get in that particular career path. Right, right. I think that's excellent, excellent advice. I wrote down its relationships, and I underlined it like three times after you said it, because I think that's so key. And I feel like the earlier that we can learn that, um, the better off we'll be because sometimes we get caught up in the academics of law school and the reading the case file and the this and the that. Um, but it really is all about relationships. Um, and, it, and it's not just your firm. It's about right. being involved in the bar or the younger lawyer section of the bar. You know, when I ran for office, because I had been involved in the Atlanta Bar Association and the the state bar and other organizations, I had this network of people who knew me for working in volunteer projects and knew that I was willing to work hard on things that gave me no reward other than helping where there was a need. And so when I ran for office, there was this network of people. Of course, there was the big Mercer network. Sure. But but these people who knew me from other avenues that said, hey, I like her. She works hard. I had a reputation with this other circle of friends who were willing to give me money, take me into their law firms to raise money, help me with volunteer work on my campaigns. Those are our relationships, again, that come back, circle back to your benefit because you were out there uh, putting in some shoe leather mm-hmm. on projects mm-hmm. that helped your community or or an issue that you were passionate about, and those people will remember you. I'm glad you said that, service, because that dovetails kind of into my next question. Um, for those who may not know, you are a longtime Gall member, very dedicated, um, very, very dependable, and we call on you a lot, and you always answer the call, and we thank you so much for that. Um, but how important is service to our profession? And and how important is it for attorneys to be involved in that way? Maybe pro bono projects, maybe charitable interests, philanthropic venture. Like as attorneys, I know it's a demanding profession and we're called on to do a lot and be pulled in many, many different directions. But what's your take on that? What's the role of, of service as far as attorneys are concerned? Well, I, I think service is essential. And, and just as an aside for Gall, I, I've always will always have a special place in my heart for Gall because when I went back home to, I started practicing law in Atlanta at a big firm, 
when I went back home to practice in Bainbridge, I was the first and only woman in 11 counties in Georgia. So there was no Gaul chapter. Wow. To be had. I would have killed to have had a Gaul chapter wow. or a Gaul lunch or a Gaul meeting. You know, so <laughs> I will always support Gaul because to have sisters in the profession was not something I had for a long time when I practiced in Bainbridge. But again, it goes back to what kind of reputation do you want to build and what kind of reputation do you want lawyers to to have mm -hmm. each one of us i think has a responsibility to our profession to further the reputation of our profession lawyers right. get a bad knock of being greedy and selfish and mean and ugly from a television right. version of a lawyer right we all individually have a chance to blow that reputation out of the water by being the caring people who are there for the simple things and the complicated things. You know, law, I, I, I've said this so many times when I was the dean at Mercer Law School, law, lawyering and legal education, we train people to be problem solvers. Yes. And so whenever we can use our legal training, our skills, uh, our focus to help people solve problems, we have such a tangible impact on the lives of people, our clients, mm -hmm. or when we do pro bono service, we change the lives of people for good and forever. I still, I mean, I have not actively practiced law in a long time, but I still run into people who say, you handle my mother's divorce. It, she will love you forever. You handle my father's wow. I, I, I had a, wow. a person here at Georgia College. We will never forget you. You handle my father's divorce. Wow. Uh, you know, it was a long time ago, but they remember every aspect of what I did for them in a divorce case uh, way down in Bainbridge, Georgia. So don't think that every little aspect of what you do for a client goes unnoticed. It, it makes a lasting impression for the actual work you do and for those service hours that build your reputation and build the reputation of our profession. I love that. I love that perspective because I think you're exactly right. And lawyers are uniquely positioned to impact lives in a way that no other profession um, can do. And so that's what we're called upon to do. We're going to um, be wrapping in a couple minutes, but I did want to, to ask you kind of off topic, but sometimes I do that. Um, I'm curious. I find you to be very interesting. And so I'm like, wow, she was cultivating plants. I just would have never saw her picture <laughs> in the encyclopedia and thought plant cultivator or any of that. Although I do love your background. It looks incredibly zen. Um, but what is maybe a little known fact? I mean, there's been so much written about you. I don't know that we could even find a little known fact, perhaps on our own without you helping us. Um, a little known fact that maybe people don't know about you. Well, there are probably a million um, <laughs> little known facts. Uh, many people don't know that I have a degree in agriculture. Uh, so that's always a fun one. But actually, my in my first job as a newspaper reporter in Gainesville, Georgia, as you referenced in my introduction, I, I had to cover the courts. I was the police reporter for the news paper. So okay. I had to go out day and night with a police scanner to cover murder scenes, car wrecks, oh fires, take pictures, write about it for the paper. And then I would have to cover everything until a trial of somebody charged with a crime. That And that led me to law school. Mm -hmm. But in that process, I would have to go out in the middle of the night to take pictures of fires. And so I would be out there taking pictures of these hardworking firefighters in the middle of freezing weather and so I went through the certified volunteer firefighting training in, <laughs> with the Hall County Fire Department. And I became a certified volunteer firefighter. Uh, I got my own set of turnout gear, which is really why I wanted to do it. So I'd have that warm turnout coat and I could get really close to the fire to take better pictures. Um, I had to go through training fires, which scared the bejesus out of me. I'll just yes. tell you. Uh, yeah. It gave me a whole new respect for the work that firefighters do and how they put their lives on the line and and sacrifice their lives for our safety. But uh, I became a certified volunteer firefighter in Hall County many, many years ago and uh, lived to tell about it.
So I'm just picturing you in the turnout gear with your camera in the middle of the, like, that is a great, great story. I'm so glad I asked that question. <laughs> That's a great story. I, um, I'm a person who likes quotes. And so I, I came across a quote as I was thinking about sort of how our conversation would go. Um, and I think it's probably a, a really fitting place to end our talk. And it's by um, Ayn Rand, the author. And she said, she's quoted as having said, um, the question isn't who's going to let me, it's who's going to stop me. And I feel that is so, so true in everything that you've done for our state, for our profession, and for our organization, the Georgia Association for Women Lawyers. Thank you so, so much for coming by. You all, this is Kathy Cox. She is amazing. Um, and you heard it out of her own mouth. She does believe in service. She believes in giving. She believes in uplifting the profession. And so she is one of our heroes here in our She Was the First Conversations with Women Trailblazer series. We're so, so glad she was able to come by. If you want to know more about Gall, or if you're inspired to join, we make it really, really easy. All you have to do is go to www.gall, and we're spelling that G-A-W-L, dot org, www.gall.org. There's a little button right there on the homepage. It says join or renew. We would love to have you, or if you just want to see what the organization is about and kind of feel out if it might be something that's a good fit for you, please stop by the website. Until next time, I thank you so much for listening. This has been Kathy Cox. Take care, everybody.